everybody! It is time for another episode of What I Made. This is the occasional video that I make about my crafting. Nothing to do with books, though I have listened to a lot of audiobooks while working on these various crafts. So uh, today we're gonna have a new topic because aside from my usual knitting and crochet and a little bit of sewing, I've actually taken up another fiber arts craft which is spinning yarn. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about the spinning first and then I'm going to jump into the finished objects and then works in progress or some of the works in progress. And then I'll probably end with future plans for just whatever projects I'm leaning towards next. And as part of that, I'm gonna show you a bunch of yarn because I went a little bit crazy buying yarn in September and October for reasons and we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Okay, the spinning is what I am very, very excited about. I finally went to a beginner's spinning class in early October, and I spent a, a day there. It was like an all-day class, but I used a spinning wheel for about three hours and listened to like demos and stuff for an hour and a half or two hours or so. And it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. It was also like my first like class in-person social interaction with strangers in like two years, and it, it was really good actually. <laughs> Exhausting, but I really liked taking the class and doing the thing and learning about spinning wheels, but also just like talking to people was nice. And I'm an introvert, so I can tell you like how starved for human contact I probably have been. But I came out of that class thinking I really, really want to be able to practice spinning more. And I wanted to get a spinning wheel, but they are very expensive. Like I, I have my heart set on this Kromsky Sonata wheel that I used in the class. I loved it. It was the kind of style of spinning wheel that I need because it's very compact and portable and stuff. And I don't have much storage space in my house, but um, it's $900 plus an extra couple hundred dollars for accessories and add-ons that are pretty necessary and then shipping and handling and all this sort of stuff. So I really couldn't justify buying one of those. But when I was talking to some of my friends in the Stitch and Bitch group, uh, Chelsea was like, so do you know that more affordable electric spinners are on the market? And I was like, no, I thought that those were like $800. But no, there is a more affordable one. So I got one. It was a nice uh, cost compromise there so I could keep spinning and practicing on an affordable tool and kind of build up to proving to myself that I would actually use a real traditional spinning wheel. So let me show you what I made and the spinning or electric spinner. I can't, I can't really call it a wheel. It's not a wheel, it's a spinner. So this is what I made in the class and you can see it's very thick or thin. It's mostly mystery fiber. I think a lot of it is Corydale because Corydale fiber is highly recommended for beginning spinners because it has a pretty long staple length. Um, so yeah, I was just grabbing mystery fiber out of a tub in the classroom and it's not as terrible as I thought it would be for my first ever attempt at making yarn. Um, so there are some sections in there that are actually pretty neat looking and then there are bits that are just like, what is this blob? I don't know. Uh, but I really enjoyed making it and I could tell I was getting better in the class. So this is my first ever real attempt at spinning yarn. And then I got my electric spinner and I went a little bit crazy. So the electric spinner that I got is this thing. It is the Electric Eel Wheel 6.0 from Dreaming Robots. And I believe that new ones are currently sold out because of supply chain issues. They make a very, very tiny Nano one though, which is incredibly affordable. I think it's like $100 or less. Um, I think that one is still available, but I wanted this. Um, it has like this big eight ounce bobbin on it and I wanted to be able to spin a lot <laughs> rather than like the little one ounce bobbin on the nanos. And yeah, um, it has all the standard parts of a spinning wheel except you do not treadle it to make it go. It has a motor, um, so it usually is a plug in the back and it does have a foot pedal so you can turn it off and on with, the, with your foot. And then you control the speed with a dial over here. And it can go very, very fast, but there's no way I'm ever going to use more than like 50% of the speed capability on this thing, because it, it goes so fast. So that is the uh, eel wheel. <laughs> Such a weird name. So what I made first, 
on that is this. This is just some random Corydale fiber from Paradise Fibers. I bought this for a knitting project last year and I never really, I decided not to do it. So I just had this sitting around in my house. So I spun it up as kind of a test to kind of learn how the um, e-spinner actually works. And you can see already there's a pretty big improvement. Um, I can feel that it's kind of ropey. My singles are still over twisted and but the the plying is pretty good i feel like um plying is a lot easier than spinning singles <laughs> just something more intuitive about it i guess um but this does have kind of that dense ropey feel to it because there's just too much twist in the fiber but aside from that um it's it's a two ply and i think my singles were a lot more consistent and a little bit finer than what i did in the class so that was really fun. I have no idea what I might use this for. I actually think that these two being my first ever spinning projects, I might just keep them for a while so I can kind of compare and see my progress for, you know, because I, I like seeing how much I've improved over time. And then we get to the two most recent spinning projects I've done, which I am much happier with. Like these are the ones where I felt like I made a little bit of a breakthrough and I was gonna be able to make yarn that I would actually use. <laughs> and both of these are three plies uh, because two plies are, I think, kind of easier. And a lot of people spin two plies. They're kind of that traditional um, structure. I wanted to practice doing three ply yarn from the beginning and get comfortable with it because that's what's pretty similar to commercial yarn. Commercial yarn is more likely three or four plies and it has that plumper, rounder structure to it, whereas a two ply can be kind of flat. So I'm practicing three plies right now, but it does mean I get less yardage out of fiber as I'm still learning to spin singles that are finer and finer. So the next thing I did is this thing. I love how this looks. Um, this is fiber from um, Paradise Fiber's Creepy Corydale collection. It's a color called Werewolf. And I'll try to insert a picture here of what it looked like when I was prepping the fiber before I actually started to spin it. I thought the colors were a bit eh. Um, it looks better in person than, than the picture on the website. When I actually was spinning it, all those colors kind of mushed together and it's so pretty. I really, really love how it looks. I wanted to buy like a whole bunch of this, like 16 ounces of it for a future project when I can spin a little bit better, but it's sold out now. Ho hopefully they bring it back. Um, so this is a three ply, 100% Corydale and I think it's still a bulky weight. I think it's like six or seven wraps per inch. And I think I've got about 85 yards of it. And I'm, I'm pretty happy. I realized that um, my singles came out pretty nicely, but there are a few places I can see after like I, I finished the yarn that it seems like there isn't quite enough twist in a few sections. So I think my plying, this is my first time doing the three ply. I think it was a little bit loose, but aside from that, it's really nice. It's very squishy. It has that lighter, airier feel to it, so not ropey and dense. I just like squishing it. <laughs> this made me so happy when I was done with it. I think I did this entire thing over like two days on a weekend, and I was just obsessed. Though spinning that much without taking breaks over two days is not good for your body. <laughs> I will say that. And then my most recent spinning project, this chunk. I actually have two, a uh, big one and a little one. Um, this is Merino. This is also Paradise Fibers. It's their Merino humbug color. So it's like a cream and a gray. And when you spin it, it comes across as this really pretty heathered gray color. And this is also a three ply, but I did much finer singles. Um, so this is eight ounces and I think I got about 350, maybe 370 yards out of it. So I forget what the wraps per inch is. I think the wraps per inch was like nine or 10. Um, so I think it is a worsted weight yarn or maybe heavy worsted Aran or something based on the yardage. Um, I'm still not really sure how to, um, tell. Even though I can measure yardage, I'm not sure like how, what the gauge would be when I knit it up. So, um, but I have enough of this, you know, over 300 yards so I could actually make something with it. And I'm really happy with it. It was really fun to do. I was getting a lot better at spinning very fine singles. I think 
Like I actually used the control card that came with my spinner. And so I was checking like, like mostly 35 to 40 wraps per inch for the fineness of the singles and between 20 and 30 degrees for the angle of the twist. So I was trying to check it constantly and make sure that I was being more consistent. And I think it worked out pretty well. Anyway, I'm very happy with these and I'm currently thinking, because um, I have some other fiber that I've just gotten, I might try to spin some more three plies that are roughly the same weight as these. It'll be good practice to see if I can duplicate the structure and the thickness of a yarn with another spinning project. And if I get enough colors, I might be able to do something uh, like one of Andrea Mowry's uh, patterns. She's got like the shift cowl and the night shift shawl that use, that I think a lot of people use their hand spun yarn for those. And I like the look of them. So I may end up with enough yardage from different spinning projects to combine like three to six colors and do one of those. So we will see. But once again, this came out pretty squishy. Um, I was really happy to see that there was like stretch and plumpness when I got done finishing it. So, oh yeah, I'm gonna be very, very nerdy about spinning for a while, guys. All right, moving on to finished objects. I have three of them and I feel a little bit disappointed with how all of these turned out. Just little things that make me wish I had made other decisions while working on these projects, but none of them are actually terrible. I'm just being extremely perfectionist about them. But the first one is a little shawlette. Looks like this. There's some really cool texture in this. I'm not sure if the texture will really show or not. Um, but this is a pattern called Expeditious by A.S. Anderson. It is a free pattern and I was looking for a one skein shawl or like shawlette project to show off this beautiful yarn. This yarn is Essence of Autumn Zephyr in the color um, September, I think. So it is a like merino silk cashmere single ply colorway. It's really, really luxurious. Um, so I wanted to do something special with it. It was a gift from my friend Chris, and I really enjoyed knitting this. The texture is what really drew me to it. Um, so there are like these kind of modified garter stitch sections, and then this really interesting crossover stitch. It's like a crisscross stitch where you do these elongated stitches and then you crisscross them in the next row when you knit them. It was really fun to do. There is a major problem with this pattern though, and I wasn't able to really correct it despite reading a lot of other people's notes on Ravelry. I just didn't correct for it enough, and that is that the edge of the shawl is way too tight. As you can kind of see at the beginning, it bubbles a little bit at the beginning of the, sh of the shawl, and then I was like adding more and more length to the slip stitches and it made the rest of it a little bit better. But if you knit this pattern just the way that it tells you to do the three stitch, like a uh, slip stitch edge, it's really a really common edge on shawls. Like I've done plenty of, of slip stitch or I-cord edges on shawls now, and I've never had this problem where it is way too tight. You see, there's no give in there whatsoever. So when you block it out, the, the fabric of the shawl stretches like crazy, but the edges do not. And a lot of people recommended doing an extra yarn over when you um, knit the edge stitches and then you drop the yarn over for more length. I did that like crazy in this and it still did not help enough. So I'm rather disappointed with that and I wish I knew why it is. I think it might be because of the way that the increases are done on the shawl. There are increases at the edge right by the slip stitch edge on every single row. And maybe that tightens it a bit more as well. I don't know. So I find myself relatively dissatisfied with how this blocked out. Even though I heavily, heavily blocked it, I still have this weird bit at the top. But you know, if you wear it like a bandana, I guess, you're not gonna really see that. If you just wear it kind of like this. Um, you might see some of the texture, but you're not gonna see that, that weirdness. So this is how I plan on wearing it. <laughs> we'll call it good. And it's really beautiful, soft yarn. Like if you find, 
wools to be a little bit scratchy against the skin. Merino with silk and cashmere. It's like, it's like butter on, on the skin. It's amazing. So I'm glad that I found something to use this yarn for, but part of me wishes I had chosen a different pattern. I don't know, <laughs> but I can't really ask too much though. It was a free pattern. So the other two projects that I have to show you are very, very big. <laughs> One of them is the final, final time we're going to do a check-in on the Handsome Chris pullover. I have been working on this for seven months, I think. Six or seven. So for the majority of this year, I have been working away at this. And this is a free pattern. It's a little bit more like a recipe, which is a reconstruction of the famous sweater from the Knives Out movie um, that Chris Evans character wears. So it is heavily cabled. There are cables all over it. Um, and I am very proud of myself for actually finishing this. It is probably the most daunting project I have ever knit. So many cables, so much time. I ended up kind of making up my own neckline shaping. Um, I did my own shoulder shaping. I figured out how I wanted to do the sleeves on my own and everything. Um, so it was kind of a confidence booster, if you will. The issue with it, and I will actually put it on to show you, but it ended up blocking out so big. I, I just didn't remember how much the a cabled fabric expands when it relaxes and kind of just breathes a bit. It expands so much. So it ended up being one or two sizes bigger than I wanted it to be. Now that I'm wearing it, you can see why it is so big. Like this is how wide it is in the body, but like this is the edge of <laughs> my torso. So there's probably like eight to 10 inches of positive ease in this. The sleeves came out pretty nice. Like the, the circumference of the sleeves is good, but I feel like the Michelin man, I feel like I've got all this bulk on my sides and around my shoulders and stuff. It's kind of weird. It is very warm. It is very cozy. It's, it, I might keep it for myself just to like layer on, like pile on over other things in the winter when it's really, really cold because it will keep me warm. Um, but otherwise I wish that I had like taken a whole repeat of cables out of the side, <laughs> like made an extra, extra small version in the pattern, but it is done and I'm very, happy with just how I was able to make up some parts of it and still get a result that looks pretty nice. Um, the one thing that I might still change though, if it keeps bugging me, is the neckline. I thought I'd made a pretty tight neckline, but then it also expanded a lot with blocking. It was much tighter before. So part of me thinks that I might rip out the neck ribbing and pick up far fewer stitches and kind of cinch it up a little bit more. And then it will give me a neckline that I think looks a little bit better and sits a little bit better. But I'm not sure if there's anything else I have to say about this, but it is done. <laughs> finally, finally done. And it looks really cool. And the other thing that I made is another sweater and it's not showing up very well because it's such a dark green and it's very bright outside right now. Um, but this very floofy thing is um, a mashup of two Augustan patterns. So I used the base of the Augustan's number one top, but I knew I wanted the floofy lace cuffs <laughs> from Augustine's number 14. And then after I had done the cuffs, I actually completely freehanded the peplum at the bottom to match the lace cuffs. So it's basically a mashup of Augustine's number one and number 14 with my own variation for a lace peplum because I felt inspired or whatever. So this is knit entirely with knit picks. It is uh, stroll fingering held double with their um, a loft base, which is a mohair silk. So it is very floofy. It's knit at a pretty loose gauge, so it's very drapey. And I actually haven't blocked this. I don't typically wet block things that are knit with mohair. I know you're supposed to. Um, this one I will, hopefully to cinch up the fabric a little bit more 
and even things out, but I just have been too lazy to block it right now because I just, yeah, <laughs> I need a lot of floor space to uh, lay out sweaters and shawls and I just haven't had the room in my office. So um, the thing that is most cool but most impractical about this is the sleeves. They are big puffy sleeves with these very big lacy cuffs, which have um, a pico edge on them, which I really love. So let me stand up and maybe you can see the texture on this a little bit better. It's probably not showing up great with this light. Um, oh, there it goes. It's like blowing out the color so you can see it now. I did not do the front ruffle. There's supposed to be a ruffle attached, um, I think down the sides here on the front, but that was a little bit more than I wanted. And then if I really stand up, <laughs> maybe you can see um, the peplum that I did. So yeah, um, I also did something different for the I-cords. I'm supposed to knit I-cords for uh, the cuffs and for cinching it up at the waist. I just did braids instead with uh, multiple, multiple strands of the yarn. And that is also kind of an inspiration from the Augustine's number 14 pattern. And I like how that worked out. I don't think I would have liked the super stretchiness of the I-cord cords. <laughs> um, this is a little bit more structure, but the cuffs kind of annoy me because if I pre-tie the cords to fit around my wrist, then I can't get my hand in it. So on this, I might get some elastic in there and then just tie the cords loosely as decoration. Uh, but then it'll give me a way to like pull it up a little bit and fit it around my arm so it doesn't slip down, whatever. So this was a lot of fun to make and I love the dark green color. Um, it is a labyrinth in the aloft and aurora, I think in the stroll, they match each other perfectly. And it's, it's really lovely and soft and floofy and drapey but it's incredibly impractical. <laughs> Mostly because of these very extra sleeves. So I feel like I put a lot of effort into this and I'm not gonna wear it very frequently. It's like a dress up thing. That That's okay, right? <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, so I don't know if I'm gonna do more of Augustine's patterns in the future. Um, these were the two that I found most interesting and I mashed them up into something that was pretty cool, but it's overall not really my style, but something something new to do with my knitting. All right, now moving on to works in progress. I have three that I want to mention today, and I think these are all new things. I've never shown them before because I started them over the last month or two. Um, in September, when I was really, really trying to finish uh, like the Handsome Chris pullover and getting um, the Augustine's one done, I started to get really burnt out on big sweater projects. And I was like, I'm going to start small things, which I kind of did, but I don't find small projects to be as satisfying for some reason. I don't know. So I've been sitting on some works in progress that I haven't really done anything on. And then I just started these other three projects because I don't know, cast on itis or whatever they call it. So the first thing is a pair of socks that I have barely worked on, uh, but it is my small project right now. And um, I'm being smart and I'm knitting them both at the same time. Some people like my father can knit uh, two socks on the same circular needle, like magic loop style. I've tried this, I cannot get it to work. I mean, I understand how to do it in theory, but I don't enjoy it. Um, since I often end up with two different size socks when I knit them one at a time, um, my second sock is usually tighter and better fitting. I decided to get another pair of circulars for magic looping socks and I'm doing them at the same time. These are the Curly Whirly Socks uh, by Anushka of the Crimson Stitchery and the yarn I bought specifically to make this pattern because they are summer socks. So this really bright like almost like marigold yellow orange color is um, from my friend Chelsea's um, hand dyed yarn company, um, Spinning Tales 
uh, fiber, I think, and um, I forget the name of this. I ha seem to have misplaced the label of it, but um, it is one of her sock yarns, and I think it's from her Creek collection, one of, one of those. Um, I'm not like a an orange-yellow person most of the time, but I thought this was a perfect fun color for a pair of summer socks, and it just spoke to me in the moment. Um, so that's what I'm using for this, and I haven't knit enough for you to even really see the pattern, but it's going to be um, basically lace and a lot of twisted rib. Much like the other pair of socks that I made from the Crimson, Crimson Stitchery, which were the curly whirly socks, and I really enjoyed making those. They look really cool. Um, so we will we'll see how long these take me to make. They're basically going to be shorty socks. I'm not planning on making them very long because they will be for summer wear. Um, I just haven't felt like knitting on socks for the past month. <laughs> I'm not going to admit how long I've been sitting on that one. <laughs> this has been a very interrupted video because I'm baking bread at the same time and I keep having to go check on it when the timer goes off, so if you hear beeping at any point in this video, that is why. <laughs> the next project, more mohair. You're going to probably detect a trend over the next couple of projects that I am working on or I'm going to start soon because... Mohair. Mohair. I just like the floof. Anyway, in September I got the first issue of Morit magazine. This is a really, really nice, high-quality um, magazine devoted solely to crochet patterns. It's pretty much pom-pom quarterly or making stories, but 100% crochet. And I loved it. I think it looks really neat. I backed it on Kickstarter because I was curious what the patterns would be. And I got it, and there were two patterns from this that I really, really wanted to make. And the first one is this. It is the Sivu sweater by Linda Skuya, who is um, 11 Handmade. I made a couple of, of her patterns in the past and really enjoyed doing them. She uses a lot of interesting textures and st stitches and stuff. Um, so I was going to make this, and I bought yarn for it. I bought two colors of Knitting for Olive, Merino, and Mohair. And when I started to make it, I couldn't get past row four of the ribbing. It just did not work for me. I completely abandoned it, even though it's very pretty and a very unusual um, design, I guess. So I decided to make the other pattern from this that I really liked, which is the Kishi Vest. And I think that vests are having a moment right now. I have become very curious about them for my own wardrobe, but I'm seeing a lot of patterns now for them, and I'm, I'm on board with this trend. I'm trying to find a better picture of what I'm making. Um, there you go. Um, so it has a split hem, and the back of it is longer than the front. Um, I just liked the details of this. It's really unusual for a crochet garment design, in my opinion, and it uses this um, basket weave stitch pattern, which um, I think just looks really cool. The texture is really cool. So I have repurposed some of the Knitting for Olive yarn that I got for the Sivu, and I had to get some more because I didn't have quite enough. And let's see, this is the front. That's the front, right. So, um, or I should say the right side. This is actually the back piece. And um, it's gonna be very long. I think that I may have not understood exactly how deep the armhole is on this thing. I should have taken out like two inches of the armhole, but whatever. We, we'll see what it looks like. I often don't understand how something is actually going to fit or look when it's in pieces. I have to actually seam it and put it on to realize that, oh yeah, it looks just fine. Um, so you can see that um, basket weave stitch there, and then it has this ribbing at the bottom, which is, it's very dense. I'm kind of surprised at how heavy and dense the, uh, the ribbing is. Um, but the way that it is crocheted is pretty unusual. I've never seen a crochet ribbing like that before. Um, I have had some problems with row gauge on the ribbing though. I didn't have any problems with gauge on the basket weave, but this, I had to take out a bunch of rows in the ribbing to get it to fit in the space that I was working across, and I'm not sure that I did the shaping correctly. I think that blocking is going to be really important, especially to get the triangular effect. So I have the back piece entirely done, um, and now I'm working on the front piece. And it is much shorter because it is a split hem with a short front, 
and I haven't really picked a front, but it's got this very deep v-neck and it'll have more ribbing on it as well. Um, and it's been very interesting to work on. It's been a, a long time since I have worked on a complex crochet project. And crochet I love for like accessories and blankets and stuff, but I am not yet to be convinced that it is the best thing for garments. <laughs> And my last work in progress that I want to show you is the one that I am extremely enthusiastic about, and it is a brioche shawl. You know me, I love brioche. But I'm calling it my Halloween shawl. The pattern is, I think it's Seriously Holy by Stephen West. I'm finally doing a Stephen West pattern. Um, and you can see that there are these very large increase sections that create these holes. It is so cool looking. And once it's um, really stretched out and blocked, you'll be able to see it a lot better. Um, this shawl is working up exactly the way that I envisioned it for the colors and the yarn that I'm using. Ugh. So, I saw this main color, which is um, kind of this variegated, slightly speckled, I think, yarn. Um, it is from the Sheepy Shire, and I think the color is called Pumpkin Latte on a um, single ply merino base. It's a fingering weight yarn. And I was just like, I want to knit brioche with this color. It is so lovely. It's such an October Halloween color. And I wanted to really make it pop on a dark background. Now, this pattern is designed with the, the background color, um, this color, um, being a really fluffy Surrey alpaca lace yarn that is um, probably thicker than a mohair lace, but it's very expensive. And as much as I wanted to try something with um, a Surrey alpaca lace, I decided to go with an alpaca sport weight yarn instead, um, which is what this dark gray color is. And I am so happy that I made that choice. Um, this is Cloudborn Fibers Alpaca Sport. Um, it is like hugely discounted on webs because they're, it's a discontinued um, yarn brand, I think. So I got um, enough yardage and I'm really happy that I did that because it's not only like the right color and the right softness because it's still that really baby soft alpaca, but it's a difference in texture as well. The main color is this very, very sleek single ply yarn, but the alpaca is plumper and much fuzzier. And it is a sport weight rather than a fingering weight. And it's just lovely. I love the way that it looks. I love the texture up close. So that is it. It's a bit difficult to show because it's not blocked and it's still really bunched up on the needles. I am about two-thirds of the way done with it now. Um, so I'm almost about to begin the shaping on the bottom edge of the shawl and getting to the point where there are, I think there are about 450 stitches on the needle right now. And they're going to be, I think, over 500 by the time that I bind it off. So it is a good thing that I like brioche. And I would say this is a really easy brioche project. Um, it is basically just plain brioche knitting back and forth, back and forth. And every 15 to 30 rows, you have an increase row, which is also very easy because doing these big holy increases is uh, relatively simple. So I think it's gonna look really, really cool. It's gonna be a very dramatic shawl because of the colors and everything. Um, but it has been surprisingly my plain knitting project for the past month or so. But anyway, I'm very happy with how this is turning out. <laughs> I have a feeling that there are going to be more Stephen West brioche shawls in my future because he does some really cool stuff with texture and brioche and I like that, even if I don't share his same appreciation for wild neon colors. And lastly, as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I bought a lot of yarn in September and October. There's just been a lot of stuff going on in my life and I decided to just let myself enjoy my hobbies and the beautiful, beautiful squishy yarn. So um, more of that knitting for olive <laughs> yarn that I mentioned. Um, I got this color, which is, I think it's the Bordeaux, yeah, the Bordeaux color in both the Merino fingering weight and the um, Mohair lace yarn. And this is more of the color that I was gonna use for that Cebu sweater. 
and I actually am going to use this for a pattern that just came out recently. It's called the Pelto Collar by Jenny Ansa. And I think the texture of this is really cool. I bought the pattern and looked at it. I think it's called like a wheat field or hayloft stitch. I think it's gonna look really cool. And hopefully this um, beautiful burgundy Bordeaux color is not too dark. It might hide the texture a little bit, but whatever. Um, it is also a little bit like a vest. It's actually a collar, so it's not seamed on the sides, but um, I might actually have enough yardage to make it a bit longer and try to seam it. Some of the testers for this pattern said that they thought it could be easily modified into a vest. We'll see, maybe I should just make it the way that it's it's intended, I suppose, um, and just enjoy having the coziness around my neck in the winter. So yeah, that's what this yarn is for. Then because I was at a yarn store for my spinning class, I could not resist the urge to buy yarn. I should have bought fiber, but I bought yarn and I had a discount because I took the class from that place. So I could not resist. I got more really floofy, soft yarn. I got four skeins, about 100 grams of this Shibui Knits Silk Cloud, and it's so beautiful. I, I literally got it because the color is just so beautiful. It kind of matches my shirt today, actually. <laughs> it's this like plummy burgundy color. What's the color called? Oh, this is also called a Bordeaux. Why are burgundy and Bordeaux, like wine colors, such common names for yarn? Anyway, this is also mohair silk. Yeah, it's 60% kid mohair, 40% silk. And it's just, it's stunning. There are 330 yards in each of these. So I have 1200 or more yards of this. And yeah, this is just such a splurge. I have no idea what I'm gonna use it for, but we will see. I just, it's my color. <laughs> I've also been on a John Arbin textiles kick. I ordered some of their yarn um, from England. Um, they're based in Devon. And then I actually picked up some more of their yarn when it was uh, carried by a yarn store that's close to me. So I got these two colors in their Harvest Hues line. This is the Harvest Hues four ply fingering weight yarn. So the um, kind of teal color is blue spruce and the more golden color is pollen, I think. No, it's called flax, I was wrong. <laughs> um, these two colors I'm going to use in a humongous, very challenging brioche project. It is the Madame Chic Shawl by Hasagar Knits, I think is what her design company is called. Um, it looks amazing and it is massive and I've been pretty intrigued by her brioche designs in the past so this is going to be a monster project. I don't know when I'm going to begin it but it will happen at some point. The other John Arbin yarn that I got is very similar color actually to that blue spruce but it is more of a, a blue than a teal and this is their Yarnadelic sport weight yarn or heavy fingering weight in the color indigo dust. Um, last time I showed you guys my um, Ginkafite tee that I knit out of John Arbin, and that was a special colorway on their Yarnadelic base, and I loved knitting with it. I thought it was just a really beautiful sport weight yarn, and because it's 100% Corydale, it does have a little bit of a sheen to it. It's not like a silky sheen, but it was just a really pretty luster to it. So I knew I wanted to knit more with uh, that yarn. And I got this for a vest project. I don't know what it's going to be because the pattern hasn't been released yet, but I've seen testers versions of it. So I'll talk more about that when I actually cast it on, I think. But I got enough yardage to be sure that I would be able to make that vest. It's gonna be lace, I think. I have just two more to show you. Like I said, I went kind of crazy over the last two months, but um, I got some matching uh, sock yarn and uh, mohair yarn from Nanette Wake's studio. I love her stuff. Her stuff is always being recommended to me on Etsy. Um, and I got enough of this to make another polka polka hat, which is um, a project I showed you guys in the last video. So um, it doesn't take that much yarn. It takes like 50 grams of fingering weight yarn and like, I don't know, 15, 20 grams of mohair. Um, so I got some matching colorways. This is a colorway called Hurricane Ridge, and I think it is really, really pretty. 
So yeah, this will be a hat project for when I need something small and a lot of plain knitting because it's just a lot of stockinette. And then I got a mystery skein from Vol and Vine Yarns. Um, I follow Kristen Lehrer on her YouTube channel. I watch her videos regularly and her hand dyed yarn sells out so quickly. I usually don't even try to catch a shop update, um, but she did some strange brews, which are basically mystery colorways, like one of a kind mystery colorways. And I nabbed one pure luck in September and um, it's called Ma uh, Bloody Valentine. It's on her FTSE base which is um, BFL and nylon and I think BFL is really lovely. So uh, once again I don't really know what I'm going to do with this. Um, it might end up being a one skein shawl. I think it is um, semi-solid enough that I could probably do the geology shawl, which is a really cool textured one skein shawlette project. Um, but I think this color might also look really cool in a pair of brioche socks. Um, I bought a pattern, I think it's like basic brioche socks um, from the designer who did the hedge maze shawl. Julia Decker, Dune and Knits, I almost forgot her name. Um, so I actually have that pattern in my library and I might use this paired with some like black yarn as the, um, the background color. I don't know. I'm still deciding on what I wanna do with this. And that, I swear, is it for yarn acquisitions for right now. Um, pretty much the only other yarn that will be entering my life from here to the end of the year is gonna be uh, stuff that I spin myself. <laughs> if I can keep my fingers off of other yarn. We'll, we'll see though. So that is the fiber goodness in my life over the past couple of months. Um, let me know what you have been up to, what have you been making, and hopefully I'll be back to show you some more progress on things before the end of the year because, oh my god, we only have like seven weeks left in 2021. I am looking forward to the holidays very, very much. Anyway, enough rambling from me. I hope you guys enjoyed this dive into my recent crafting. <laughs> Thank you for watching and I will talk to you again soon. And until then, bye.